It would seem that everywhere one turns these days, there are books, articles, films, and television shows on the subject of how our technology has remade the world and continues to remake it. It's among the leading topics of everyday conversation. As I see it, the subject is mainly about how television and movie cameras, Xerox machines and computers, reorder our psychic habits, our social relations, our political ideas, and our moral sensibilities. It's about how the meanings of information and education change as new technologies intrude upon the culture. These are the words of Neil Postman, one of America's most eloquent and outspoken critics of technology and the so-called information revolution. For more than two decades, Postman has been looking into the effects of modern technology on education, communication, and language. He's fond of the adage that, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Persistent banging can be annoying, of course, but consider what happens when you replace the hammer with a more sophisticated tool like a computer. To a man with a computer, Postman says, everything looks like data. Postman is the author of some 20 books, including Technopoly, Amusing Ourselves to Death, and most recently, The End of Education. He's been called everything from the guru of the new Luddism to master gadfly and visionary. He teaches at New York University, where he chairs the Department of Culture and Communication. He works out of a small, cluttered, smoky office on the seventh floor of a Manhattan high-rise. When I talked with him there recently, I asked him why it is that Americans have such a fascination with technology. Americans have always had uh, what de Tocqueville called a lust for the new. I mean, that has been uh, a centerpiece of American culture and accounts for much of our vitality. So that uh, beginning in the 19th century and right up to the present time, Americans especially have been uh, fascinated with technology and have uh, generally believed that human progress and technological innovation are the same thing. But uh, now it's even more acutely believed because of the uh, sensational kinds of technology that we've been able to uh, produce in the last, um, oh, especially the last 20, 30 years. Have you always been interested in this topic, or is this something that has sort of gained urgency over the years? Well, I, I, you know, I have um, been interested in the past in uh, television, which, uh, let us say, was our last great, awesome, culture-changing technology. And I wrote uh, three or four books about what I thought would be the impact of television on especially American culture. And uh, I tried to avoid taking an interest in computer technology, but that now, of course, is just not possible. Uh, you have to uh, confront computer technology and uh, what it is doing to the culture and what it is undoing to American culture. I noticed that in your office here, you don't have a computer. And uh, when I came in, I noticed you're scribbling away in longhand. Yes, I... Which I, is uh, <laughs> such an unusual phenomenon. I, I write all my books on um, with a pen and, uh, and a yellow pad. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, have a computer. I don't have email. I don't have voicemail. I do have um, cruise control <laughs> in uh, my car, but that's only because you can't get uh, certain cars today without cruise control and electric windows. I particularly dislike electric windows because I was once on the Pennsylvania Turnpike in uh, February trying to get to Pittsburgh, and my uh, electric windows stopped right in the middle of its ascent to a closure. So I had to drive all the way to Pittsburgh in the freezing weather. Um, and that's made me suspicious of electric windows. Um, I might say, Scott, that I don't deprive myself of technology for moral reasons. If I have determined that a certain technology actually is good for me, and helps me solve problems that uh, I couldn't solve otherwise, then I have no objection to using them. Uh, but I'm, I'm always uh, alert to asking the question, what is the problem 
to which this technology is a solution. And um, I also follow that up with the question, whose problem is it? Uh, because there are problems that technology solves that uh, may be significant for some people, but not for me. In which case, I would be indifferent to the technology. Then, of course, there are uh, technologies that are solutions to no, to no problem that a reasonable person would uh, think about. Like cruise control. Uh, well, I remember when I uh, bought, uh, I was trying to buy this Honda Accord, and the uh, salesman told me, uh, he announced it uh, rather casually, that it had cruise control, for which there is an extra charge. And I did ask him, what is the problem to which cruise control is the solution? And he was a little taken aback. He said that uh, no one had ever asked him that. But then he quickly added, it was the problem of keeping your foot on the gas. And I told him I'd been driving for <laughs> 35 years and had never really found this to be a problem that needed to be solved by my giving him extra money for it. Uh, so uh, uh, I think there are pro um, uh, questions that one can ask personally. Does this technology solve a problem I need solved? There is no doubt that one of the effects of a high-tech world is not only to speed everything up, but also it, uh, a new technology, uh, which is always called information technology, has put a great emphasis on um, information, as if more and more information is what we need. And it doesn't seem to me that that is the case. I mean, if, if there are children starving in the world, and there are, it's not because we have insufficient information. And if um, uh, there is crime rampant in the streets of some of our big cities, it's not because people have insufficient information. Uh, speaking with social critic Neil Postman, this is Insight and Outlook. What do you think are the great critical questions that we need to look at as we approach the 21st century? I think, for me, the most uh, compelling question for uh, Americans would be the one that we uh, discussed before. Is there any uh, raison d'etre for America? Because there are people, many people in the world, who look to America as its great hope. And do we have some answer for these people other than believe in a market economy? I mean, if people overthrow the great narrative of Lenin and Marx, as they've done in many places, and and we applaud them. And they turn to us and say, do you have some narrative that we may be able to adopt and adapt? If all we say is, as Newt Gingrich basically says, believe in a market economy, then I think there's lots of trouble ahead. And by the way, this is the question that Václav Havel uh, has raised continuously and discussed when he spoke uh, to the United States Congress. Where will we get new narratives that will give uh, people a sense of, of dignity and, and hope? And um, uh, people look to America. Do we have an answer for them? I mean, this is the question. So you're writing a new book. Yes. Um, a bridge to the 18th century? Building a bridge to the Building 18th bridge. century. <laughs> um, I, can just, I can just imagine what the reviewers are going to say. <laughs> oh, they say, this guy is, uh, he's going, he's moving in the wrong <laughs> direction. Uh, I got the inspiration for this when I heard President Clinton give his State of the Union address. And he said uh, that he wanted his administration to be remembered 
for, among other things, being uh, an education administration. And then he said that he gave his vision for education in the 21st century. And he said that what he dreams of is every school to be wired to the internet. This was his goal for the 21st century for education. So I thought, well, God, this guy doesn't have an idea about it. That was his goal, not a means for something. And this is to be the education administration. Well, that brings to mind this wonderful quote that you use by uh, by Thoreau. Yes. That uh, all our inventions are... Inventions are, are, are but in improved means of an unimproved end. Marvelous phrase. Yeah. So, uh, so then I thought, Scott, well, look, we're going to take into the 21st century all of that stuff, you know, the internet and, and high-definition television and cellular phones and virtual reality and what have you. But surely we'll want to take in some good ideas across the bridge along with it. And then I thought, well, how many good ideas were there in this 20th century? And I must say that uh, 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 I've turned out to be quite an enemy of that century. And even if you're not, you have to admit it's hard to be its friend. I mean, this century has been characterized by almost continuous mass murder far exceeding anything in the previous two millennia. So I thought, well, we had some very good ideas in the 18th century. So maybe I could be useful to people by reviewing for them some of those ideas and saying how we might use some in the years ahead. I'm not saying that I think we should become the 18th century. By the way, they still burned witches in the 18th century, and some of the horrors of the Inquisition, in Italy at least, was still going right to the end of the 18th century. So I'm not saying we should become the 18th century, but just use it for what it's worth and for all it's worth. And I think there are plenty of wonderful ideas that um, uh, can be uh, uh, revitalized and uh, reordered so that it'll give us some perspectives on what to do with all that new technology. You know, uh, uh, Kierkegaard says in, in the notebooks he kept that there really is no such thing as a, a visionary in the sense that whenever you look ahead or think you're looking ahead, it's only a reflection of something in the past. You know, whenever you see these, uh, you know, Star Trek, for example, when you see it, they're, they're just re <laughs> replaying uh, the past, they're not really looking into the future. So I say, well, then, if that's true, if whenever someone tries to look in the future, all he or she is doing is reclaiming some idea from the past and projecting it into the future, if that's so, then we should be very careful about what ideas we reclaim. So I don't know what, that, what you know, um, you know, the what Utney Reader say. magazine called you a visionary. Yes, they did. And How did you feel about that? Uh, well, I, I, I liked it I, because I liked some of the people I was uh, connected with. Uh, and, no, that, that was all right because um, maybe in the end it'll turn out that the visionaries will be those who, who will say, well, we, we need some good ideas and where can we get them? We're, we're going to have to get them from uh, people who have lived before us. And uh, maybe there'll be uh, women, <laughs> dead women, dead black women, or uh, dead white males, or dead Chinese philosophers, or what have you. But wherever we can, you know, we don't have so many good ideas that we can afford to ignore um, the ideas that our predecessors came up with. In any case, it doesn't really matter uh, what uh, label people affix to you. If you've uh, come up with at least one idea that people say, you know, that, that's not a bad idea, then you're way ahead of the game.